Welcome, I'm J. Michael Silver, and this is Foundational Steps, the show where I talk with people about the choices they've made to get where they are in life. In this episode, I'm talking with Dr. Unadi Makawani. We have an amazing wide-ranging conversation. Dr. Unadi is a family physician, MD, and a certified transformational life coach. Check out her new online course, Men Get Depressed Too. All the links and timestamps for everything we talked about are in the show notes. Please support the show by leaving a comment or review. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Check out our links for our affiliates. You might find something of value. Enjoy our conversation. So welcome, Dr. Unadi. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Michael. I'm yeah. so happy to be here. I'm, I'm really excited um, because uh, other than just right before we started recording, the last time we talked was on Clubhouse, I think months ago, like quite a while. So this is, this is pretty cool. Um, and I know you're so busy between your general practice and your, your public speaking and your show. Uh, so this is awesome that you've made time. I appreciate it. I feel honored. Thank you so much. Um, so let me, let me jump right in. I want to ask you a question. This is a little bit of a multifaceted question. Um, so at what point in time did you first feel in your life that you were conscious in your body and the choices that you were making actually had an impact on the reality around you? And, and at any point in time, there's no right or wrong answer. So whether you're three years old or whether you're 30 years old, like there's, there's no wrong answer just from what's your knee jerk reaction. All right. Yes. Thank you so much for that question. Actually, I think I was seven, you know, uh, I'm a family physician. I think when I became like when I was seven, I knew I wanted to work with people. I've always been a curious kid. And I remember actually growing up in my small town in South Africa, I knew I, I actually, I loved this show bold and beautiful. And, um, uh days of our lives i not the, Amer even, the american soap operas yeah Amer yes <laughs> oh my gosh growing up everyone watched that stuff but i did not even focus because i mean i didn't know anything about romance but mm. i loved the fast cars and i saw i was like you know that's the life i want you know i could not imagine these cars in my small town in my dusty town so i knew from that moment that i was not meant to be there so i spoke mm. about it and thank god i had an awakened mom who just propelled me to that. So I fortunately I was blessed, good in sciences and went into med school. And even in med school, everyone knew that I would be living abroad. And indeed, because one thing about me, I love good life. I love helping people. So living in South Africa, I knew that living, coming from a, a background where we help each other in my family, I wouldn't be able to afford that, mm -hmm. right? as a young physician. So I practice more here in, in Canada, actually more than in South Africa. So as a little girl, I knew I wanted my big life outside South Africa. That's and, interesting. And, yeah. you, and you had that awareness at seven years old. At seven years old, or probably I was younger than that. And I knew I wanted that, you know? And I remember actually, I struggled a little bit in math when I was in grade eight mm -hmm. and went back again. And I think it was just a misalignment with the teacher because every other subject was great, but my right. mom was very supportive and I went back because at some point I wanted to be a lawyer, but then my mom kept reminding me, you wanted to be a doctor and you know, and I did, I got good marks. I got good tutors and here am I. So it was only from that point because every friend, I remember when I was still in South Africa working there, people were like, are you still here? You know, because mm -hmm. everywhere, when we had conversations, people knew I wanted to be either in Ireland or in South Africa. I mean, in Canada. Why Ireland? I have friends in Ireland and I visited. Yeah, I mean, Ireland's amazing. I, my friends uh, who actually live in Vancouver uh, are from Ireland and, and they went back to Ireland to get married. And so I went for the wedding and, and to travel. Such a beautiful country. It's but beautiful. I, like it's wet and cold and rainy. Like it's beautiful. I but yeah. I don't like they moved, they got out of there. So what made Ireland on, on your radar in and the my, first place? It's closer to South Africa. And my mom actually is a nurse. She was with, she was in England for over 10 years. So mm -hmm. I wanted closer to her. I think that was the main thing. So with my plan moving abroad, Ireland came first. And for me at that time, it was easy because as a South African trained doctor, you not even need exams. You just basically register and you are in. Oh. 
right? Oh, so there's so a, that was yeah. the main thing. Honestly, I wanted to be abroad. I wanted to be, and of course, at the time they were paying more than in South Africa with the plans I had to help my cousins to travel. So that was the easiest. And of course, be closer to my mom. Mm -hmm. And, and so were there, were there Irish shows or did you know anything about Ireland like at that point in time or early on? At that time, I was just looking at the country. It's beautiful. It's lush. And yeah. I mean, I've been to England at the time. I was like, oh my gosh, I just love, I didn't care about the rain because rain also has a good memory in my heart because growing up, I loved playing in rain. So yeah. I didn't care about that piece, but you know, they, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful country. I've never been just looking at pictures. Yeah. I yeah. wanted to be part of it. And actually my partner actually has friends. They always wanted to visit them. They love it there. Yeah, I mean, if you haven't still haven't been, then you should definitely go. I mean, it is such a beautiful right. country. Yeah. And my uh, when my friends got married there, um, my one friend's cousin and I just went on like a week long road trip all around um, wow. the the east coast, down the south, up and around, and then kind of back through the center, uh, back up to Dublin, then across to the west coast, and then they got married in the Connemara up on the kind of the a little bit of the not quite northern but a, a little bit north of center on the west coast it's just gorgeous I it's where the the, the kind of mar is where the leprechauns are if there's leprechauns that's that's where they are in the, in the right? yeah i do <laughs> want to go i do yeah so when just to take us back to you're seven years old or you're in that you know elementary kind of grade school ages you wanted to get out and you you weren't like you knew that this wasn't, you know, South Africa wasn't going to be your life. So um, like, how did that affect your social setting? Like, were people like, you know, making fun of you? Were they angry at you? Were they encouraging? Like, how, what was that like? Right. I'm fortunate. I come from a family where people traveled, mm -hmm. you know, and also my family has that background of political background. I have my grandfather who traveled out of the country, was in mm -hmm. exile and seeing multicultural. Your grandfather was in exile? Yeah, actually he went to law school with Nelson Mandela. They were oh, all wow. together. Yes, yeah. So I come from that background. So the listening to people's stories from abroad, you know, it was something that fascinated me. And also mm -hmm. one of my grandmothers, when she came back to South Africa, we had Ghanaians in the family, you know, the gatherings, Nigerians. So it was so nice to see all this multicultural Mm -hmm. right so that I, I didn't have any problem and but but as a person I don't like for me I, I've never been a child that gets laughed at you know and entertained that we do all that as kids but mm -hmm. I think as a person I've always nurtured that or maybe natural I'm like that I don't get affected by other people's opinions just as a person that's good yeah, no, I've never, in every decision, I always say, even at varsity, I never had that peer pressure. I didn't do what I didn't want to do. I did what I wanted to do. I had bad choices. I had good choices. But I was never that kid, that fa fa face day being, okay, this was uh, peer pressure or, you know, someone is going to laugh at me if I don't do it. I didn't care. My God. That's, that's yeah. amazing. I mean, I feel like that's a pretty rare thing. The, right. When I was a kid, we had a saying which I feel like the saying is completely defunct now, in, 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 at least in, in America in today's day, which was sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. There so that was, that was the kind of phraseology, the, the magic spell, if yeah. you will, that you know, protected you know, my generation as children. And like, not that we didn't get hurt, not that you know, there weren't kids that were sensitive and you know, or bullied or what have you, but for the most part, I felt, and a lot of my peers felt like that kind of protected us. That was our mantra, you know, say what you want, go away. We don't care. You know, we've, we're, we're doing our own thing over here. Um, but now, people, right? Yeah, that's not the case anymore. Yeah, I know. It, you know it, what? Actually, I've trained my son. I mean, with all the cyber bullying too, you know, like you said, it's not the case anymore. How many kids we hear of, even adults, who kill themselves from bullying, from yeah. cyber bullying, people who yeah. are cowards who will bully others. So That's I think horrible. I love that mindset, to be honest. And my son is 13 and we talk about cyber bullying and he said, mom, I just, you know what? I block trolls. I don't have time for that, right? That's so amazing. we need to have such a generation of kids that, you know, these people are cowards. You cannot, but of course I'm aware of some people, they are already struggling mentally. Mm -hmm. So they become vulnerable targets, unfortunately. So 
You you mentioned earlier, which maybe plays into this. You had a, a fairly multicultural background with Nigerians and and Ghana, Ghana people yeah, from Ghana. Yeah. I don't know what do you yeah. call someone from Ghana. They're Ghanaians. 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 Yeah. Um, yeah. So is that is that a normal thing in South Africa? Where were a lot of people? Um, because to me, like if I look at the map, I think like these are countries really far from each other. From each other, yes. So yes. It, it's kind of surprising or shocking. Yeah. Uh, and most people, I don't think in America understand how large the continent of Africa is. <laughs> like the <laughs> continent of Africa, I think is is large enough to stick like like three or four United States, like the okay. entire contiguous you know, United States in there like three or four times. Um, so, so was that a was that a normal thing in in South Africa where you, within your like friend group multiculturalism no, and no no mostly people most especially you know how South Africa is designed you know we have our provinces you know mm -hmm. I come from the Eastern Cape where our tribe is Kosa I'm Kosa right and then people who live in Gauteng you know where there's Johannesburg mm -hmm. there it's it's more like multicultural. That's where mm. you see the multicultural, you know, aspect of our country, because even other people from other countries, that's where most it's our main CBD. Where that's where they're going. Yes, mm -hmm. most opportunities. And also as South Africans too, the Kosas are there, the Tswanas, the Sutus, the Zulus, because that's where money is, right? And then people that are coming from outside, like people from Zimbabwe, Ghana, Nigeria, people doing business there. But from my small province, it was, I mean, just looking at my town, I mean, in our town, we attracted quite a few teachers from Ghana. They're very good with math. Mm -hmm. So in the 70s, I think with their political issues in their country. So South Africa hired a lot of teachers from Ghana. Yes. So yes. it made, I mean, that's, that's amazing also though, because it gives you, I mean, it, it's a little bit like the United States because we do have a lot of different cultures here. I don't think they always publicly get their due but i think in the reality they're there they and you yeah, know they're they're very well um you know spread out across the country everywhere middle america and you know and so forth um so that yeah it's it, it's really it's interesting to me because you know being from a culture that is so different than my culture you know the american culture um it's interesting to hear how multicultural your upbringing was and how like diverse you know and how close you know these these different um you know different nations were to you yes. uh and now side question um but how many languages were spoken in south africa oh man we have more than 13 i believe 15 13 i think we have 13 official i mean english is our main yeah language most of people in South Africa could speak at least three, four languages. Okay. Right? I mean, I growing up in my primary school, we did, my first language was my Tosa. My second language was English. My third language was Africans. Africans, okay. basically, you remember we were Dutch colonized. Yeah. Right? Africans yeah. is, I'm familiar with from movies and, and so you. forth. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So most people can speak three or four languages, five languages, or even wow. more. Right. Yes. Yeah. Now, does that make like, things yeah. more confusing or less confusing when kind of making your way through adolescence and, you know, you're kind of working your way through coming, you know, to, to leaving, to getting your degree and, and leaving, like was navigating, you know, people and culture, was it easier because there's multiple languages, because there's more ways of expressing yourself or was it more difficult because there's so much, so many more ways to express yourself. But like I said, I grew up in my small province, Eastern Cape. So mostly we're speaking in Kosa, okay. right? Yes, we're speaking in Kosa. And again, went to university in my, again, my province, right? So we're speaking and there'll be very few minority people that were coming from outside the country who would come and again, would be speaking in English, right? right. So that diversity of languages is mostly in Johannesburg. Oh, right? I see, I see. So, so yeah. Kosa, am I saying that right, Kosa? Pardon me? Uh, uh, the language Kosa? Kosa, yes, I'm Kosa. Kosa. We have a lot of clicks. That's the only language in South Africa that we click, click. I mean, yes, we are the clicky, clicky. Okay. 
Lovely. So just to get an idea, how big is the province? Is, are we talking like uh, a million people, five million, a hundred thousand? Oh, oh my goodness. I have never thought of actually doing the calculation, but yeah, like, I mean, it's big. And here's the thing. I mean, South Africa is, is a country close us. I think we are, no, actually Zulus. I'm not sure if you remember in, in, in the film, there was Shaga yep. Zulu. Yes. Yep, yep, yep. They are the largest. They are the largest. Okay. Right. Yes. But we are all Nguni tribe, like the the umbrella, the umbrella tribe, we are all Nguni and then Kosas came out of that. But Zulus are the main big, uh, what is it, tribe. The only thing I have to compare that to is, you know, they, the, they say the 12 t- tribes of Israel, you know, so the Jews right. <laughs> have their different tribes. Right. So is it something similar to that where there's multiple tribes under I, like yes. one nation and then then each one is you got it right Michael. okay yes 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 i want to go you know there's so many places in africa i want to go my father has been and done work in senegal and he's done oh. work in ghana um I, I think nigeria as well i don't know if he's been to south africa i have friends from um uganda and, and sierra leone and and um, i've been to uganda in 2016 i did medical volunteer work there it's it, it sounds like, I mean, there's problems everywhere, but it sounds like there was at least a while back, uh, yeah. one of my friends from there, like, was, it sounded more like she escaped <laughs> than... Well, uh, I, actually, in 2016, I nearly canceled my trip because they were, they, it was a voting time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, there was... Things were bad. Yeah, yeah they were bad. Yeah. yeah, I think, I think her and I met probably around 2014, 2015. Mm. Um and I remember her saying things weren't good, but, um, but yeah, there's, there's so many places I want to go and so many, you know, I mean, it's, well, it's so big. It's <laughs> massive. And before you travel, you feel like, oh my goodness, I haven't done anything. I can't wait for this pandemic to be over. I want to go back to traveling. Tell me about it. Yeah. Uh, I, I think everyone's ready for it to be over. So yeah. fingers crossed sooner than later. Um, okay. So you're, you, you, you go to school, you're, you're, um, you know, from a social standpoint, it sounds like you really don't even have, you're kind of so strong of spirit and, you know, your, your family and everything else that you're not really bothered by much. So was there a point in time in college or after college where you ever felt like you had, because I mean, you are a, um, you're a doctor, you're a mental health expert. I mean, you, you deal with a lot of, the problems, you know, both physical and non-physical of, in the human condition. So at any point in time, or at what point in time did you first experience any of those problems firsthand, or did you? You know what, Michael, I always go back to my state of awakening actually was when I worked in a psychiatric institution mm-hmm. to meet, I always say people judge people who are drug addicts, but guess what? They are the most awakened people I've ever met. They are so true. They are so honest. And I remember actually even learning how to use language, you know, Mm -hmm. choice of words. I actually learned that. I remember I was quite fortunate. I worked here. I was the youngest and my consultant made me one of the lead physicians and it was a rehab unit. So what we would do would come in. So I'm the physician. There's a social worker here. There's a psychologist. There's... Um, psychiatrist, consultant, uh, basically we're going to summarize this patient in front of us, right? Mm -hmm. And then at the end, there's going to be group sessions. So those were my favorites because that's where you get to listen to people's stories, what made them to come to this life, right? To to be here. And I remember asking this man who had blown out, I mean, back then, that was back in 2006. I mean, 30,000 Canadian dollars was a lot, right? And this man was stealing from his family's money. They, they were wealthy with him and his wife, but they were basically going bankrupt because of his drug addiction, right? Mm. So he, so I was listening to his story and I said, I understand. And I said, you know, you're nodding your head. And then he, 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 he actually paused and said, have you ever tried drugs? And then I was like, nope. He said, then doc, don't say you understand, you know, when you understand, you, you know, and actually it brought me to 
honestly is to presence and also just to feel and be in the moment and also understanding that sometimes we just say things and it was not big I was not even pretentious you know I was just saying yeah I get it I get it but he made me understand that it's more than just saying you understand a person are you really feeling are you really empathetic do you understand and you are you coming from a place of non-judgment right mm -hmm. and there's so many other stories that really humbled me they I learned so much from those people and how actually the other thing I learned I remember one time there were two guys that came from a forensic department who they came to basically teach us about cocaine all the crack and all that stuff and as we were sitting there they said do you know that each one of you probably if you're honest you probably want to try these things right and honestly I was like yeah it's true because you probably want to see how you feel right and he said I just want you guys to realize that each one of you is curious right and each one of us some come from a background of people are have addicted I mean addiction or probably mm -hmm. like personalities so that's what happens to these people so don't judge because you could be that person yourself no one chooses to be hooked no. on these things absolutely no. not right yep. it's a disease addiction is a disease right so when you come from that place you are more compassionate too mm -hmm. uh, you know so that's where I learned honestly my deep awakening and also understanding and compassion came from that work I did it was only six months but it changed my story it changed the narrative I have yep. I just understand most people when people come up with all these stories and they judge these people I just come up with a different perspective that you know what guys each one of us could go that route, you know, mm -hmm. and never come back. No, I think that's an amazing realization because, you know, to a certain extent, you know, the acting, you know, because most of my life, like the predominance of my life has been spent in, in, in pursuit, in pursuit of acting as a career. Mm -hmm. And I've had every career under the sun pretty much it feels like anyways i've had so many different jobs and i've trained for so many things and i've sold so many things and learned so many skills because i needed to make a living i needed experience i needed to be a human i needed to learn how to live um to be an actor because right. you can't be an actor and you can't play a character unless you're able to inhabit them and bring life into them now you don't have to be a rape victim to play a, a victim of rape because right. you can understand betrayal and you can understand dominance and you know power and all the other facets um so um you know i did experience probably more things than i needed to um from from the from an acting standpoint from an artistic standpoint but one of the things you learn along the way in the pursuit of acting and studying and training and, and working towards that is that it's difficult to impossible to really understand anyone's story if you have any level of judgment whatsoever. Yes. Because as soon as you put any kind of judgment, then you're putting up a boundary that keeps you from seeing a side or understanding an instinct or um, an, you know, something that's, that's going on for them. And you know, and also, ironically enough, um, non-judgment is, you know, one of the major, you know, foundational uh, steps in, in mindfulness. You know, you know, you can't have a good mindfulness practice uh, without non-judgment. So, I mean, I, I think it's really an amazing experience and, and can't be expressed enough. Like, you know, if anyone's listening, like practice non-judgment, like first and foremost, because okay. any conversation you have before non-judgment takes place and you're able to step into that zone i feel like is is kind of uh it's already starting off kilter you know it's already an off balance conversation but i'm actually i'm actually pleased to have this conversation about this because i recently had it with a friend i said you know what in the last two years specifically you know how the pandemic hit us hard mm -hmm. i've had this i don't know where these men are coming from like i mean some have referred each other to my practice and people, they just, when they come into my practice and they go, dog, I just felt, I felt at home here. Mm. I shared this story. That's I great. mean, I have people who shared stories telling me this, I'd never even shared it with my parents and they start tearing. You know what I mean? 
so I think sometimes without even open our mouth, like our body language, our demeanor, the energy we bring in, these people, they have never met me. And they come and said, I felt home. I felt like I was home, you know, and yeah, they removed and, their masks. And it's got to be because you learned how during that time, you know, working uh, in that facility uh, oh. with addicts, you learned not to, you know, prejudge or not to put any, you know, that's, that's such an amazing thing. Now you actually, it's, if I remember correctly, you do a lot of work with men, correctly? Cor I, yeah. Now, is that something you had planned on doing or is that something you fell into? No, it actually chose me. Like I said, like I said, when I saw like this shift, when COVID hit, mm -hmm. I saw all these men, even my own patients that never came for any antidepressants, you know, they started sharing their stories. And I think part of it, I think probably I said this on your, um, on your room in cl on Clubhouse, how we seeing a shift, men are speaking more. And I mean, a space like Clubhouse, men are more vocal. Mm -hmm. So when we had a lockdown, uh, patients would call us, right? And these people were sharing their stories on the phone. And then of course, when we opened and they started coming in, and then I said to myself, okay, if these people are coming in, they are coming from somewhere, from the community, then I cannot just stay in these four room, I mean, four walled rooms. Mm -hmm. I need to come out and speak about it. And then probably that's where you saw my work. And I started talking more about childhood trauma, how it affects men specifically, because I know that we've been focusing on, you know, and, and, and empowering the girl child, but we are leaving the boy child behind. And I think it's probably coming from a place of pain because of the long standing patriarchy. Yep. So it's kind of like coming as no, it's a girl child's, you know, time right now, but we are leaving the boy child behind who tomorrow will be that man who's going to be abusive to the girl, that, that empowered girl, right? My, my fear uh, around that, um, and I shouldn't say fear, but it's a concern right. um, because it is what it is, but there is a concern and the, not every single, you know, male has this, but typically speaking, you know, majority, the testosterone starts kicking in around, um, around um, puberty right. and that testosterone is a monstrous chemical <laughs> hormone yes. and we as uh, you know with the coursing testosterone limited ex especially in america limited impulse control limited ability or knowledge or experience on how to control our impulses and how to channel them and guide them in a in proper productive and constructive ways if the males are cut out of the equation because we only focus on the female uh, and the young girls, which is needed, no question. Absolutely. But if they're cut out, then they're going to be even less skills, less um, you know, tactics, techniques to deal with the raging hormones, which right. you might as well give them all PCP. I mean, right? You know, because it's it can be that level of of you know um, anger, excitement, you know, jealousy, all the things that are unchecked, un unguided, unchanneled, that will blow up in all of our faces. Right. And right. I know what it was like to go through that. And I had martial arts since I was a little kid. I had a good family. That's why had... it came to my mind. I said, like, you know what? We need to have more of that. You know, yes, you know, it's actually, if I'm correct, it's sublimation. That's what it is. When you see a child with so much of that rage, you know, how do you rechannel yep. to have yeah. positive outcomes? And I think that's right? it. I mean, like, we just need to rechannel it. We just need to yeah. harness it. And I'm not, I'm not advocating for children to work. Um, however, <laughs> perhaps there is work that the young males can do <laughs> with their raging hormones. Because, you know, the female hormones, they go through their own thing from what I understand. I'm not a doctor, obviously, but from what I understand, and you jump in and correct me, but my understanding is that the females just don't go through the same type of rage and same type of um, just really dynamic energy right. that is explosive. And, you know, I perhaps, you know, if it's not for sports, if it's, if there's not some sort of ritual uh, physical practice 
or labor or something like right. to rechannel that energy. Yeah, to rechannel. What are we going to do? Testosterone is definitely a heavy chemical than estrogen, right? I mean, we do have some levels of it, sure, but sure. you know that's why men are more faster than women in in in, in sports like in yeah. athletics right yep. in athletics you know so i mean that hormone is something that someone needs to do something positive <laughs> yeah and it, i mean it's needed too i mean the diversity of you know masculine and feminine and the different different levels of masculine and different levels of femininity whether they're found in a male or a female i think those different right. levels and the different ways it's outlet i think is so vital to the human experience so mm -hmm. i don't want to tamp i don't want to stop any of it i just want to channel it you know i just a positive want positive outcome that's yes. what we all need balance right yep. we do and that's why we need like we we're talking in the beginning we need good role models yes we need good role models you know i'm starting to see a lot of movements of men guiding and coaching young boys we need more of that Yes, I always say there's so many like I mean there's Oprah, there's Michelle Obama. These are famous people that are very influential and they're doing amazing work to empower girl children. But we are the men. We want to see more men empowering boy children so that we could balance that energy, right? Yes, and I mean I think, I think I I mean I can't think of anyone that comes to mind that is in a, a position of power, or celebrity that is doing anything on the scale of like Oprah or Michelle wow. Obama. There are definitely, there are definitely men out there that are doing things, but I don't think there's like a, a figurehead, you know, like a, wow. an Oprah or a Michelle Obama that's like trying to lead the charge. And I, I do, I agree. I think there needs to be one. I think, you know, wow. some person I, you know, I kind of feel like LeBron James might be a perfect person. I don't know if he wants the job, but I feel right. like oh, who doesn't look up to him, you know, literally exactly. and figuratively. And look at Obama too, right? Yeah. These are men who could cause ripple effect. You know, can you imagine how the world would look like? You know, I, but I feel like the only person that doesn't like uh, uh, LeBron James is whoever he's playing against, you know, like, if they, you know, like, <laughs> he's good. Obama, like, it's hard not to like Obama as a person, but there's plenty of people out there will find something wrong with his politics or right. something else where I feel like, like, yeah, I, I hate to say this, but I think even racist white men like LeBron James, you know what I mean? Because right. he's such an amazing an right. athlete and and like he's so successful he's even killed like his show the barber shop is amazing like i feel like i, I feel like i'm nominating That's him right now <laughs> look at trump if trump could say stuff like this i mean this man is very influential you know i always tell people yeah. that he's powerful guys yeah. he's a powerful man right <laughs> look at how he's you guys he's actually holding he holds oh, yeah. his finger right yeah he still has sway over i would say half the country and oh, the preponderance of the media on he's any awesome. media outlet i feel like to a certain extent is uh wrapped around his little finger you know if he's going to say boo then they're gonna go oh really what huh like oh, should we jump now uh, right yeah, it's kind of ridiculous mm -hmm. there there is a vacuum right now for um, leaders in general, I think male and female. I mean, I think more women are stepping up uh, across the United States. Uh, I don't know much of anything about Canada's politics or Canada's kind of hierarchy, but in America, I do think there's more or less a power vacuum because no one, very few people trust anyone in power right now. Wow. And so there's so few people that are able to, you know, give any kind of um, togetherness, any kind of, you know, hope, like for, mm. for community. Um, you know, I think of, you know, in, in our ever evolving is world. COVID? Is it pre-COVID or even, is it worsened by COVID? It was made a lot worse by COVID, but mm. it was pre-COVID as well. Yeah. And I think COVID just made it glaringly obvious because everyone stopped what they were doing and said, 
who's leading no one why what are we doing right and like leadership and this is my opinion leadership brings people together right it doesn't divide so if we have a media that and that is saying you know which team are you playing for which is essentially what's happening in, in the political you know arena and then you have politicians saying i'm playing for this side i'm playing for this side then all you're getting is division you're not getting leadership oh yeah and power hunger yeah he's doing it best who is stronger than the other right who's more yeah. powerful who has a better opinion right we are drifting apart it's so sad it is it's it's troubling and you know i i think for the most part the only answer is kind of the grassroots reality you know we need um to for i don't know just the easiest way to to say this is is to be a little bit black and white but to uh forget about what's going on on the national level forget what's going on in the big picture and focus on our communities and focus on each other whoever's in your personal sphere even if they're across the country or in another country altogether and work to talk about the things that we have in common work to um focus on what can we do you know and progress exactly aggressive world it's yes. so sad to see what would become of this you know we worry about our children what are we going to leave behind yeah right? and there's so much noise on the on the national or international stage if we can if we can focus on the smaller picture in our communities in these types of conversations even across countries then we can begin i think to say okay you're not hearing us we're saying we want to be together we want a you know cohesive like you know success we yes we want to be individuals but we also don't want our roads to fall apart or our community to fall apart so i so i have a theory that or again maybe a hypothesis hypothesis because i don't have i don't know that i have enough data to to say it's a theory yet but um community is a group of people that thrive and a tribe is a group of people that are surviving mm -hmm. so with the idea that if you look back in history and you look at what tribes you know whether you know it's 100 years ago or yesterday in america or parts of africa or south america or australia or wherever the tribes are the ones that are struggling to maintain their identity their culture their um history uh because the rest of the world is saying man we don't care or we don't want you or enough is enough and right. communities are those groups of people that aren't being oppressed aren't being uh suppressed and aren't being attacked and so they're able to thrive and come together so if we can if we could be that world where we could see ourselves as a collective i even yes. thought with the pandemic where we all experienced the same pain i thought we would have you know collectively felt and said wow you guys we need each other all of us there was an opportunity in every right? country around the world and every community around the world and every 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 thing around the world and no one stepped up and said let's do this we can do this what do we need what do you need how can we help like instead it was it was division and it was yes, let's look for the differences if i want to be if i want to be politically <laughs> incorrect let's look at the the provision of the vaccines i mean africa and other south american countries got the least yep. right but here in my country we even looking at dose number four <laughs> yeah. probably even in america right so it's the survival of the fetus yeah you would have thought for such an opportunity was 
for people to say, hey, do you need this? Let's all, you know, and educate. Because now there's also that lack of trust, mm -hmm. you know, from the West. Basically, that's what happened. Yeah. African countries didn't want any of this because there were so many conspiracies, right? Yep. So it was an opportunity for us, all of us, to feel this all together and all thrive. But it was such an interesting observation to see how it was so divided. Yeah. Still. And, and there <laughs> wasn't, I don't feel like there was an attempt to unite. I feel like everything was looking for new ways of dividing, looking for new ways to create uh, division, strife, aggravation, agitation, fear. And, you know, mandates, got to be careful what we say, because we may, you know, may post this and get pulled. But, you know, mandates, I think, are something that put everyone on edge when there's no conversation around it. You know, yeah. it, it, when it's just said, this is what you're going to do. We don't care what you think. We don't care what you know. We don't care what you understand. This is what we're going to do. And now we're going to de demonize you for thinking anything different. It's <laughs> like, well, wait a second. We just want to talk about this. No, nope, can't <laughs> talk about it. It's too late. And then you have uprising. Then you have anger. Then you have, you know, what's gone on. Censorship. There's been so much happening, right? And you know, I to end. I really can't wait. I want to see peace. I really want us to come together. And yeah, and I know that it's never gonna be the same, you know. But but you know, I don't think it needs to be. So many people. If we could, you just... know, how many people in my practice stop talking to their friends, like of twenty years, thirty years, because of this? these are people they love. These are people oh they God. love and they get, they, they pick the side and they say, nope, I can't yeah. talk to you anymore because you're on the wrong side. Right? Yeah. How does this make any it's sense? Sad. It's so sad. It's so sad. I honestly thought this would bring us together. No, so many people are heading right now, lost relationships because of all of this. And I mean, I understand if, I understand if someone is is gotten information or even if they haven't gotten information and they just decide that xyz is good or bad i understand how they can get there it, it's it's an easy thing you hear what you hear you know what you know and you see what you see therefore it validates everything you know that you're you're now going to take this position but again it's that non-judgment you know if we just come in and say okay look your experience is obviously different than mine. I see it like this. You see it like this. Over time, we'll be able to understand each other if we just give it a break. You know, if we give it some time, give it some space, instead of just saying, nope, you're dead to me, <laughs> which is what I think is, is happening. Yeah. No, it's still also that goes back to what we're saying. There's that power thing, right? Mm. I'm right. You're wrong. Yep. And I'll censor you because you're not saying, you're not agreeing with me, right? That's basically mm -hmm. what I think. You know, we are not solution oriented, right? And I think that kind of goes back to the culture. Uh, you know, culture trickles down, you know, and the culture, predominant culture that wants to break free is I think one of community, one of thriving, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The power structure is designed to divide, oppress, create fear, and that's what pervades. And so that's what we get into. We get into these finite games of, you know, win-lose. There is no win-win. There's no attempt at a win-win. And, and then we're, we're stuck. You and I are stuck here going, God, if we could just, <laughs> if they could just... <laughs> And, right? <laughs> you know, and, and I think, I think if any person sat from any side and listened to us, they would agree with us, even though they might not agree with the other person sitting on the other side, who right. also agrees with us, but is saying, you're crazy over to this person and you're crazy over to this person, like back and forth, yet they're agreeing with both of us. I, I would almost put money on it. <laughs> I mean, honestly, if we could all appreciate that, yes, we have all the different opinions, but like we said, if we had that community culture, mm -hmm. we would all come, even if we agree to disagree, but to some common ground. Mm -hmm. 
what's going to work for the benefit of everyone. And, and that's, I think, the key is the common ground, because yeah. y- you don't have to see everything the way I see things. Absolutely. And if you did, I would wonder how you got in my shoes, you know, because <laughs> right? you're over there, right? I'm over here. Yes. Right? Yeah. So it's not about it's not about having all of the same experience or the same feelings. Yeah. It's just yeah. about having the common commonality yeah. so that we can agree that it's okay to stand here or over here or whatever. And then, and then we can move forward. You know, it's like, where do we plant the tree? Well, we can plant it over there and <laughs> it will get more water or we can plant it over there. It's not going to get enough water. Well, then clearly we need to plant it over there, but that's on my property, <laughs> but it will die over here. And we I both did, agree we I need to plant a tree. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it's, it's maddening at times. Um, in, your, in your private practice uh, or in your, your public speaking, um, do you address a lot of these issues head on or do you talk around these things in stories? Like, how do you deal with these things with, with clients, uh, you know, patients or, or, you know, larger groups? Yes, both, you know, we, I think always storytelling is beautiful. People can connect with stories, right? Absolutely. That's the most powerful tool I use because you want to hit that spot, right? Mm-hmm. So that's more practical. People could relate you know, to things because we all have experienced something, Absolutely. right? You know, people are tired of fluff, you know, people mm-hmm. want to connect to a story that they could identify with. So that, and then of course, there's also the element of just when I'm in a teaching mode where you just bring the factual things about a subject, mm-hmm. right? You know, then yes, there will be a storytelling there, but more so you are more educational. You know, if I have to tell you that PTSD presents like this, you know, said, and I have to tell you the facts and the symptoms that come with that, right? So it's both, really, it is. But I find storytelling, you hit that spot, people can relate, people are transformed. Mm. And also people feel like, oh, wow, it happened to that person too. You know, even I could sometimes use my own story. So people, and then they can see, okay, now how did you get to the other side? People can relate with that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I mean, I think that's part of the reason why movies and TV have such a great impact. I mean, it's part of, it's part of the reason why I've, you know, sought after that for so long is because you can create real change with the movie. You know, you can, I, I still think to this day, a large factor in the American population accepting gay marriage is because of a TV show called Will and Grace. I don't know if you had it in Canada or if you saw it. No, but I'm I'll convinced. check it out. Yeah, it, it was it was a it was a funny, it was a comedy a half hour. Um four actors, you know, each very, very different kind of you know spectrums of the human um you know personality condition you know experience. And um the two male characters were both gay and both very different in the way they kind of live their lives. Mm -hmm. And that show became super popular when gay marriage was one of the more unpopular things. And by the time that show went off the air, gay marriage was like 80% accepted around the country. So there was a point of acceptance and non-judgment, right? Yep. And I mean, acceptance is, you know, I don't think you can get to acceptance without non-judgment because the non-judgment allows you to see someone for who they are. Uh, yes. I'm actually reading. I'm actually finishing. You probably know Glennon Doyle. She wrote. Sounds Untamed. familiar. Yeah. She's on Instagram too. She wrote a book, Untamed, beautiful. Untamed. She addresses that, right? You know, she talks about how also even this homosexuality or people who are, you know, transgender, if we could just see people as they are, because probably that's who they were before. Yeah. You know, everyone else started saying, me too, me too. That's probably who they were before you yeah. even got to a point of, oh, are you? No, that's what I was. You know, I'm I, only raising my hand now because there's some point of acceptance here. Yeah. Right. You know, so yeah, she's addressing a lot of that kind of stuff. Yeah, I don't, like, because of the world, 
that I was in was different than the rest of the world. Like I didn't realize that there was such an issue. Like I didn't, I just didn't understand uh, until, until the conversation started becoming more apparent and politicized that Mm -hmm. there was a big issue. Um, I mean, I, you know, I guess I was just naive, you know, in my early twenties, but um, you know, 20 years ago, when I moved out to Los Angeles, one of the first jobs I had, I was a bartender at a, uh, a drag bar. It was called the Queen Mary. And the, the, all the performers were either gay men dressing as women or uh, trans women. And they would do performances and like, uh, I mean, it was just a fun, it was just a fun atmosphere. And I bartended, bartended there for like two years. Mm-hmm. And during that time, I learned a lot about human sexuality that I had no idea, had never been exposed to before. Um, and it was, it was a fascinating experience, but it never occurred to me that other people would be so like, like I couldn't tell someone I worked there or that uh, if someone found out, like, you know, they might hate me for like, it just didn't occur to me. And like, it closed down. And so I stopped working there, obviously, uh, you know, and they closed their doors. I think it was like in 2002 or something like that. And um, within the next few years, the politicization of like gay marriage became real prevalent. And all of a sudden it was like, oh, wow, like, I, I can't believe this is an issue in, in but, 2000, whatever. And then how the environment uh, affects us and also helps us because you were in that environment for two years. Yeah. And learned and probably just saw them as humans. These are humans, right? yeah. And now you come out of that environment and then you see other people saying, no, they're not. <laughs> it's shocking, isn't it? <laughs> the, the, the difference between humans is, um, is the difference between humans regardless of skin or genitalia for the most part. I mean, the, I, think, right? I think hormones play a role in dictating certain behaviors. Like testosterone will definitely put you on edge um, in a different way than, than uh, not having testosterone. But other than that, I, I, I think human being human is being human. And, and then the conditioning and the culture or cult, right. acculturation has a far greater impact on how you present as a human than anything else. Because like, I know when my my dad was working in Senegal uh, years ago, um, you know, and he had no problem with this, didn't even think twice about it. But when uh, another man, one of the leaders of of where he was working uh, held his hand and they went for a walk, you know, I remember my dad telling me a story. I, there's even some pictures, you know, because there were there's some publicity around uh, him being there and the work that he was doing, and um, and and I I asked him about that. He's like, I don't know, it's just what you did, and you know, because he was a world traveler and because he had been around, it didn't even occur to him that this was strange, and that was just their culture. Yeah, and like that, I think, is proof that you know all of these ideas that we have are just ideas based on stories that become a cultural norm (laughs) and then when people are faced with something outside that there's fear Mm -hmm. and then there's judgment judgment kicks in and you know people become uncomfortable right yeah there's a lot of that when you are presented with something that you're not familiar with you know, it takes openness, you know, and again, it goes back to the consciousness, mm-hmm. right? You know, you are free from judgment when you accept things as they are yep. <laughs> without wanting to impose yep. your culture or your beliefs, just accept. Yep. Right? Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's amazing how much easier it is. And it, I mean, it seems like to your, you know, to just use your life as an example, um, 
not that there hasn't been obstacles, but your, your obstacles are eliminated. It seems like really quickly because you just accept the situation you're in and then move forward say, okay, what do I need? What do I need to learn? You know what, Michael, I told you right now that I'm in the process of selling my practice. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take huge losses, but I have my health, right? I'm yeah. young, I'm healthy. Uh, I didn't come up with money. I'll make that money again. That's how yeah. I look at it. In my head, absolutely. That's not what I thought this would become. I was looking at it as a long-term investment, mm. right? But it's not working out. COVID has affected things. You know, many colleagues are moving out of the province. I'm not getting partners. It's hard mm. to run this business. I have enough patients, but I need more hands, yeah. right? So the profits are limited. So I had to take that decision as hard as it was right it's been three years doing great you know even this coming month we'll start sharing this with our patients because we have 90 day period to inform them to start looking for doctors right right, right. eagerly i'm pained but then at the same time i'm one of those people that are like what's my next opportunity what's next for me right you know because again we can always start again i'm yeah. a very strong believer in that and I think for me also, I think this COVID time has humbled a lot of us that, you know what, it's not only me. Can I stop thinking that it's me? A lot of people are suffering right now. And I mean, there's people that have beautiful story, which I think is a beautiful balance too. There's mm -hmm. people that made a lot of money during this time. Oh, it's also there's, beautiful. there's people, there's people who've made ungodly amounts of money too, which is a whole right? other situation, but a combination of things, right? Yeah. But those that made it beautifully, it's yeah. such a beautiful story to listen Despite all of this, there's people that did really well, yeah. you know, and we I mean, need to drink from that. We need to drink from that, yeah. right? There's so many people that turned, uh, turned this into an opportunity. I have a friend, um, she made a decent living prior to the pandemic, but mm -hmm. the pandemic forced her to switch her business model to an online business model. And now she's making, you know, a really high six figure salary. Wow. Or I shouldn't say salary, but because it's, you know, it's a business, but yeah. she's making tremendous amounts of, of money now. And it looks like there's longevity in it. And, okay. you know, as I've talked to her, it looks like there's a really good future for her to stay on this track. Now that may change at some point in time, but then, you know, she's just going to pivot and, right. you know, do it all over again, exactly like what you're doing. Yes, actually, there was a young man who was working as a security guard, I think in France, in one of the cities there. He's quite popular, actually. I'm going to send you a link of him. All he does, he does, actually, he he reminds me of Mr. Bean. Remember Mr. Bean? Oh, yeah, yeah. I love Mr. Young Bean. Young man doesn't talk. <laughs> he just does silly things. But now he's worth more, I think it's 2.1 million. He's a young kid who was That's working amazing. as a security guard. All he does, he just does silly things, quietly. He's on TikTok, he's on Instagram, he's on YouTube. Oh, you got to send me the link. I got to see. Yeah. You know, I'll send you the link. So people just, you know, we just need to peer out and see what's next for us. And sometimes the way I look at it, I mean, for me, I've been looking for flexibility again. And when you run a solo practice, you are stuck there. Like, I mean, I had to go to South Africa in December. My sister was getting married. Hmm. I had no option but to close. Yeah. I was worried constantly thinking, oh my goodness, did I miss results? Do you know, you are constantly working basically, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. On holiday. I don't really, I, that's not what I signed up for. And yeah. I am, I'm aware that it would have been different. Maybe pre COVID time, maybe I would have had maybe two or three doctors now, mm -hmm. but it is what it is. So I'm looking at it. I mean, this COVID effect will last for another five, 10 years. Yeah. I, yeah. I would expect at least, I mean, things are shifting so drastically and mm -hmm. we, you know, we can't go back the way it was. There's no possible, the infrastructure isn't there anymore either to go back to the way we were. We're, we're having to find new channels, new supply chains, you know, yeah. new everything. And yeah. it's, um, but again, you know, it's like what you're doing. Yes, there's pain involved, but you're just going for it because you know you've done it once, you can do it again. Right. And I, I feel like there's so many people out there, like the young man you were talking about, the security guard, that realize that there's another 7 billion people on the planet. Absolutely. And 
we can communicate with them. We can do business with them. We're connected to them through the internet. And mm -hmm. who knows what someone wants to learn. I, I mean, I had friends that uh, years back, they, they would travel to different countries to teach English, right. um, you know, and now they don't have to travel anymore. No, they can sit in their own home, make a bunch of money and then travel where they want to and not have to be in a, you know, certain country or what have you. Yeah. yeah. It's, um, it's so it's small now. The world is so small for me. I'm looking at the opportunities that came with this COVID-19. Yes, many people are hurt. I mean, globally, the, the global economy collapsed, obviously. Yeah. But honestly, I think this was here to teach us to be diverse, right? There's so much diversity. Although I feel terrible, I feel bad for landlords. Like you look at downtown in my city, mm -hmm. so quiet and dead. What are they going to do with those buildings? Right. But I also feel, I mean, now some of them may not have this ability because maybe they're stretched too thin, but mm -hmm. given a, enough time, I think land is still, you know, an investment that will pay off in the long run. The long run. You yeah. know, and that's the thing. It's like, there's a, there's a time to think short and there's a time to think long and yeah. understanding the difference between those two, I think is a, a large part of both life and finance that people overlook. It's like, are you, are you doing this for the long term? Like you've dedicated your life to helping people, but how you're helping people, it sounds like is changing. You're still helping people though. Right. Yes. So you know what? it's interesting you saying that because that, those were the questions I was asking myself in the last year, I've been trying to sell my practice. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I was actually faced with those two questions. Is this for the short term? Obviously not. I mean, I saw my practice as a 30 year old practice with young physicians in and out doing the yeah. thing seven days a week, because I've mm -hmm. seen it working with other colleagues and successfully, oh, yeah. right? But then now I was even asking myself, am I impatient to just ride the wave and keep going? But then also the pandemic has also taught us, you know, tomorrow is not guaranteed. So, you know, you're facing that. Do I just keep holding on, ride the wave, right? But then for me, fortunately, I must say being a physician is also an opportunity to grow like us, honestly, there's work everywhere, mm -hmm. you know, because the, the end goal is, of course, you impact people, but the end goal, all of us want to have money, want to make money. So now I kind of felt I was stagnant there. The profits I was expecting, was it was not happening, right? Yep. So now which one is better is to just sell and move on and still have the same prospects, right? Yeah. So, yeah, that's how I just kind of convinced myself yeah. that you know what, as much as I wanted it as a long term, maybe not for me and not right now and it's okay yeah i mean and there's a i think we i think i feel like we touched on this maybe earlier before the recording but there's got to be a certain amount of passion and joy and excitement for what you're doing yes. to maintain it because if it's just about the long term or if it's just about you know the money you will fall short every time. I don't care, you know, who you are, what your background is. Like there has to be a certain level of engagement and a certain level of, of joy and excitement to continue going because nothing's and it was easy. Slowly eroding. Yeah. That, you know, and I was like, okay, you know what now I'm slow because for me, I'm very mindful of that. Am I still mm. passionate? Am I still happy to come here? I'm at a point where I'm kind of pushing myself now and I don't mm. like that, right? No, exactly. And I mean, I feel as empathetic towards my patients, but I don't find that joy I had three years ago when I started with excitement, you know, even, yeah. you know, so yes, I think for me, it's okay. Maybe yeah. it's, I'm ready. Yeah. Absolutely. And I mean, I think there's a good chance that the pandemic sped up a lot of things for mm -hmm. a lot of people. And so, you know, where you might have not got to the place where you're at now for another three years, five years or whatever, had the pandemic not happened, um, you know, and other people like my friend who, you know, changed her business model, I think she would have gotten there sooner or later, because I think there's certain things that are kind of foregone conclusions, you know, they're, <laughs> they're in our future, whether we like it or not. And it's how you deal with that. And when you deal with that, 
that is really the key. And the sooner you deal with it, the easier it will be. Yes. And the longer it takes you to deal with it, the more difficult it will be right. um, more often than not. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm quite happy with the decision I've made. I mean, it took me over a year, really. Do you mm. know how many times actually when I started selling my practice, I, I used to work for a bigger clinic and then I called them to come in because I was hoping they could buy from me and they were ready. Michael, they were ready. Now looking back, it's one regret I have. And honestly, I think I was ovulating that day. They came, I was in tears. And of course, they had seen me working hard, trying to put this business in place. Now here I am selling it to them. I'm all teary and I'm like, no, I don't think you guys, it's the right time. And guess oh. what? I did three months later, I'm calling them. I'm like, do you still want to buy? And they said, you know what? Think about it. Six months later, I called again. No, they were not interested. Missed opportunity. But you know what? It's I, okay. It's yeah. okay. What you also you learned a lesson like, through that, you know, that was a valuable lesson because, yes. you know, that's where you got to trust yourself. Right. And that's right. such a, that's another one of those powerful things, you know, to be really, truly mindful. You know, I don't know that anyone could ever master mindfulness because there's so much to it, but, um, you know, to trust yourself, that's such a big thing. And it's so yeah. difficult in our culture. And I mean, world culture to mm -hmm. trust ourselves, I feel like. You know what, for me specifically, what, have, what I learned in this one year, I did not sell. It's the lives I saved. Mm. That really, you know, that humbles me. Wow, that's know? amazing. And should I, maybe if I sold, maybe they would be dead. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that is more than money. It is. Gift of life. So that's how I reassure myself. I'm like, you know what? Even my assistant at work said, you know what, though, Doc, let's be honest. We've done powerful things in this clinic, great things, the Sounds appreciation like of our patients. That one makes me smile. And I'm like, I feel bad for, for us to leave prematurely like that. You know, our patients are really hurting because we've started sharing it with them. Mm -hmm. But it's humbling, you know, the experience of impacting these people. So sometimes truly things, it's more than money, like, you know. Yeah. And I, mean, I think that will stay I with you too. That opportunity, yes. Because I mean, those guys, they were offering good money, but I, mm -hmm. I paid off. But now I'm getting actually 25% of what I put in there. Mm -hmm. You know, but you know what? I'm happy. I'm yeah. happy what I did there, you know? And you don't know what's in front of you. And because of the sacrifice you're making and made to do what you did for, the, for, your, for your patients and to learn the lessons, God knows what's in front of you. I mean, yeah. it could be really magnificent on so many levels that you can't even comprehend. And, you know, it's, it's all in a day kind of thing. You know, what happens in a day? There's so much can happen. So absolutely. Yes. No, I'm a strong believer in that, you know, everything happens for a reason, man. It does. Yep. And there's so many opportunities. I always feel we should not beat ourselves for missed opportunities. I mean, there's, we're human. We, cause I mean, there was a time I was like, shoot. Why did I do this to myself? And actually, I have I, I tend to be like that. One time we we're selling a house in two days, there was an offer and I pulled out. I don't know what is it. <laughs> Subconsciously, I don't think that I deserved that. You know, sometimes see, I think you're just too powerful and you don't understand your own power because you're like, I'm gonna do this, and you go and do it, and you're like, Whoa, it happened. <laughs> it happened. Like honestly, and then seriously my realtor was like yes i have good news for you literally i said no 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 but i mean again 10 days later it sold but another buyer now less off yeah. so i probably need to grow with that that just so, even that yeah, that's that's twice that's twice there you you can't let it be a third time is, no right so the next time you decide to sell something and someone offers you it. take it I need whatever to it. it is which is you know what this is paradoxical because i'm usually a very i act like a lot of my decisions that shocked a lot of people mm -hmm. looking back i'm so proud of myself i took those decisions so probably it's okay that's how i look at it because yeah. the major decisions i've taken in my life they were very they came across very strong to other people and shocking and scary but they didn't scare me and i took yeah. them and best decisions ever. 
at the same time. So I know that I, I have that aggression <laughs> with stuff, <laughs> but Brad, I do need to balance it a little bit, right? Yeah, I mean, but that's the other thing. It's like, if you're that confident and that aggressive in some areas, then, you know, these two little lessons, um, the house and the practice, could be something preparing you for something much, much bigger down the road. Uh, because, you know, that's one of the things that I've seen, you know, for people I've worked with, friends, myself, um, the more times we ignore something and the more times we see it, the bigger it becomes down the road. Light of and, and you light. know, the wave gets bigger. The way, you know, the, the uh, you know, it, it just, yeah, it, it, it magnifies. Mm. And when we ride the biggest waves are when we have the biggest thrills, you know? All right. So, right. you know, I can, I could say you, you know, just from looking at other people, myself and, you know, whatever, uh, perhaps there's just this big wave you're, you're waiting for and you're just setting yourself into position, you know, right. lining it up so you can ride this you know, tidal wave. <laughs> Man, I can't wait. But you know what? Honestly, the biggest waves I rode, it was out of shocking a lot of people around me. Yeah. And cool. took them. People are like, what? And I did it. Like, and also I'm one person. I don't need crowd to take those decisions. I'm just one, one man. That, like, I'm just that one person who is so independent in my thinking, you know? and grateful to have a partner who is so mindful to let me be mm, that's amazing yes he lets me fly you know he lets me fly i mean I, it's an everyday lesson to 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 balance that to realize that we are in partnership here yeah but i'm so blessed to have someone not to stop me because i'm i'm just like that you know, I'm unstoppable. Like I'm my, just... my partner and I, we try to give each other the same thing. She's, right. she's got a business that she's starting and she's an artist and, you know, I'm doing this. And then, you know, the other things that I'm doing, uh, you know, acting and, in, and, in, uh, insurance still, and right. we just try to support each other in every possible way. Okay. Um, you know, whether that's the little things like, you know, giving each other hugs, uh, or whether, you know, they're, a little bit bigger, making each other food, um, you know, whatever it is, you know, whatever yeah. we can do because it adds up, you that's know, and you, need. you know, that's liberating or freeing the other person, you know, yeah. and letting them fly, right. Yep. And supporting and cheerleading, you know, it's, that's yeah. what it is, you know, I that's think that's a perfect place to wrap this up. I think, you know, the, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that, that's a supportive and liberation. I just feel like that's a great message to kind of end this on. Don't forget to leave a comment or a review. I'd love to hear your thoughts. New episodes every Tuesday. And check us out on YouTube for short clips from each episode. Thank you. And until next time, remember, your life story is yours to write and rewrite as many times as you want.